Uh, at their best, cities are exhilarating, creative, and liberating. And at their worst, they're cruel and inhuman. And I suppose the question I want to explore uh, is uh, my own contention. You can't design cities anymore, but perhaps if we understand cities, we might be able to shape them. Uh, but first I want to look at the sort of complexity of the uh, circumstances we're working in. Uh, dominated by uncertainty, uh, the picture at the top is Zygmunt Bauman, Polish sociologist, uh, who contrasted the 20th century as a period of solid modernity where with enough information uh, we could control nature and create a perfect world and a perfect society. With the idea of liquid modernity, the period that we're now in, where the pace of change is such that we never have the opportunity to solidify, and therefore individuals have to find very, very different strategies to actually cope with a world in a state of extreme fluctuation. Uh, fluctuation by things like economic turmoil, uh, fluctuations in terms of population change. This, by the way, is a map of London, uh, just showing London as a multicultural city, uh, and a city where the citizens of London, New York, and probably Shanghai may well have more in common now with each other than with their rural hinterlands. Uh, and a city also undergoing very, very significant demographic change at the same time. Uh, changes in the way in which we work uh, and the way in which we expect to be working through our lives. Uh, and the uh, emergence of whole new uh, types of people in society, the transhumer, where the fleeting experience at the moment may well become more important than the material possessions uh, and changing the way in which we start to use cities. And then the changes of political complexity. Uh, this is a graphic to show how many people involved in designing one bit of open space in London. Uh, but what it does show is that perhaps as urban planners, uh, urban geographers, uh, we have a role in actually navigating complexity uh, and brokering and negotiating consensus rather than the more traditional planning techniques. Uh, and one of the consequences of this period of uncertainty uh, is not a society and cities becoming more equal. An OECD survey showed that since the end of the 80s, in 17 of its 22 countries, actually the divide between the wealthy and the poor has got greater. Uh, and this is demonstrated, this is a map of the, the Jubilee Line, uh, 10 stations between Westminster and Stratford, uh, a 10-year difference in male life expectancy. So if you travel on the Jubilee Line, you lose a year life expectancy as you move eastwards, uh, which shows the kind of starkness of some of the issues. And this is at the end of a period of boom, uh, approaching a period of austerity, uh, where one can't be optimistic that it's actually going to get better. And the consequence of this inequality can be things like sectarianism uh, and obviously the sort of social disorder that we experienced in the summer. Uh, and which is now begun to become a far more of a greater concern at a period of economic uh, contraction. Uh, so, uh, in terms of what's happening uh, across the world, I mean, uh, we do know, obviously we know that the uh, economic power is shifting eastwards, uh, that the Chinese economy is set to become the uh, second greatest in the world and possibly overtake America between 2017 and 2025 with very significant impacts in terms of the growth of cities. Uh, and the impacts of things like Mexico City, Mumbai, Shanghai, uh, and the impacts in terms of people's lives are going to be probably one of the major defining aspects of the 21st century. Uh, but this is a condition uh, in certain parts of the world. Now, in other parts of the world, we're facing uh, the decline of urban populations. Uh, the white dots on this map are citizen decline, the black dots are cities increasing their population. Uh, and in particular, this kind of shift uh, where Western Europe is actually doing quite well, but the hollowing out of cities uh, in Eastern Europe, this is Perm in, uh, in Russia, uh, suffering 35% uh, of reduction in population uh, over recent periods. And this is being echoed in other cities across these parts of the world. And then a place like Detroit, uh, a city which is hollowed out to such an extent uh, that urban agriculture is now a, a strategy being used to try and actually reclaim and reuse large empty bits of the urban fabric in a way that would be absolutely inconceivable uh, 30 years ago in terms of urban planning and urban thinking. Uh, and possibly 
uh, when you look at the factors of urban growth, the thing that is going to limit urban growth ultimately is going to be the impacts on, of climate change. Uh, that shows the position of Hong Kong, and this should show Shanghai, London, and New York uh, in terms of the per capita CO2 uh, emissions and consumption. And the green line is where we're going to need to be if we're going to produce anything like a stable situation in terms of climate change. And this, in particular, is going to be a very, very significant driver uh, in terms of how we shape and plan our cities. Um, and in this global economy, uh, I think the 21st century is going to be a period of very, very intense competition between cities. Cities are going to specialise. Uh, they're going to look at how they can specialise in terms of technology, uh, economy, uh, and environment. Uh, and increasingly, cities are now moving away from the far more formal urban strategies to look at branding and narratives to try and actually distinguish what makes them different from each other in this highly competitive economy. Uh, and quality of life in particular, I always quite like this, because I've always wondered why Calgary is obviously the place to go and live as a Londoner. Uh, and it does just show, you know, don't believe all of these, but quality of life uh, is going to be one of the key factors which uh, policymakers and politicians are going to have to consider in this highly competitive world where cities, as opposed to nation states, are competing economically. Uh, and when you look at uh, quality of life, um, you can see the incredible impact. This is Istanbul, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, Istanbul, again, another former housing in Istanbul. Uh, and uh, this is uh, in Bucharest, I believe. Uh, and we know what the problems are. We know what the issues are. We also know an awful lot of the solutions. This is Curitiba. Uh, sadly, Curitiba has been a model of how to do it for 30 years. Uh, and it's rather sad The fewer and fewer cities have really learned the lessons here. But this is just very, very simple interventions led by the extraordinary mayor, Jamie Lerner, looking at putting in uh, very, very simple interventions on public transport, around landscape, around recycling, uh, and around cleaning up the pollution of the environment and creating jobs. Uh, civic spaces, this is actually in Brixton. This is a Design for London project in Brixton. We're looking at very, very small interventions that can transform areas and form a civic life in which human inter interaction can happen. Uh, and then the sort of fostering of creative clusters. This is uh, in Shoreditch, but actually increasingly, cities like Berlin, Hamburg, London, New York, are staking a lawful lot on becoming the hubs of creative industries in a way which, uh, with the rise of the major manufacturing uh, in the Asian economies, a way in which the West can continue to keep pace, generate the ideas, and add uh, high levels of value-added uh, investment. So, how do we do it? Well, I think there are kind of four simple levels you can operate on to shape as opposed to design cities. Uh, the first is around powerful concepts. Uh, there's a couple of examples. This is uh, Barcelona. Uh, still, hopefully it won't be, but still the city that's done the best Olympics so far. Uh, and what Barcelona did, he used the Olympics, uh, not just to put on an event, but to regenerate its waterfront, to redesign uh, how it related to the Mediterranean, redesign its neighbourhoods, and in particular to invest in public spaces, as a way of actually establishing a city with this unique selling point about life, life quality. Uh, on a slightly less grand scale, Copenhagen, with the work of Jan Gale, the uh, city architect, uh, looking at how it's transformed over a 30-year period from being a traffic-dominated city uh, through the gradual pedestrianisation uh, to become an area where the, the uh, city centre is designed around the, uh, the individual, around the citizen, uh, where 50% of the journeys are made by bicycle, and whereby activities are encouraged within public spaces. So big, big, powerful ideas can drive the competitiveness and the positioning of cities in a competitive environment. Uh, the second area is around the interweaving of agendas. It's no longer enough to think about planning as being separate or design. Actually, it's the interaction of 
all of the urban agendas, from transport to health to education, that can form the platform. And in particular, the impacts of climate change and how this can be used positively as a driver. Uh, the global market for environmental goods and services is massive uh, and is going to grow. Uh, and like it or not, even in a period of very, very low levels of government investment, uh, retrofitting cities and investment in new energy sources is going to be a major area of growth in the global economy. Uh, methods of dealing with things like rising sea levels, and in particular, strategies. This is the strategy, strategy for East London around green enterprise. The weave these together... Uh, around stimulation of the employment and uh, local economy, around green manufacturing and adapting to climate change, are going to be areas which are fertile ground for the exploration of ways in improving city. Uh, and then thirdly, getting the detail right, looking at what uh, John Chase and Margaret Crawford called everyday urbanism, uh, actually understanding how we can move from the big strategies down to simple techniques to redesign neighbourhoods, uh, understanding the small scale of how cities work, uh, taking bits of city apart uh, and putting them back together again using community workshops, design charrettes with direct citizen, in par citizen participation to try and make cities work effectively. And through these, and this is the work of Willifer Watson Mann, uh, start to build bits of city piece by piece, incrementally, around very, very loose fit tactical master planning as opposed to hard edge planning, uh, and sort of significantly change people's lives, allowing the intervention and the participation to be manifested with very, very quick responses on the ground, uh, using very, very simple graphics to involve people, and then uh, techniques to try and actually allow space to be used in a far more sophisticated way within the city. And then the sort of final level, I think, moves beyond this. Uh, it's about choreography of the city. Uh, I think there's a kind of very interesting analogy between uh, city planning and uh, theatre production. Actually, it is, when you get down to this level of design, at the lowest level, it's about actually choreographing space and putting on a show. Understanding how temporary uses can be used in activities, not just as nice things in themselves, but how sometimes they can evolve into permanent uses and activities, uh, how you can use things like pop-ups and uh, short-scale uh, interventions and investments, uh, how you can use events, this is the Union Street Lido in uh, Southwark as part of London Festival of Architecture, uh, and sometimes how you can do the unexpected. This is an uh, autobahn outside Cologne, uh, which is closed on Sundays uh, as a farm in, farmer's market. But these are as much about allowing people to dream about different types of city and reimagine their city uh, as about trying to come up with end result plans or just allowing people to use a piece of space. This is in Essen, the flying green carpet, but to use spaces in a completely different way in the city. Uh, and maybe it's about unlocking the ability of city owners, uh, city dwellers, to actually dream about how their cities work, uh, allow an open approach to thinking about urban space, uh, and in particular, interweaving these strategies, not just about physical planning, but about understanding the legal and governance uh, frameworks, the fiscal vehicles we're going to need to renew our cities and extend them, uh, how we weave in environmental programs and citizen, citizen participation, in order, ultimately, to create cities which are beautiful and which are wonderful and are thrilling and are exhilarating and are not cruel and inhuman. Thanks.